Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the office of rulers and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trust in these islands. Let thy blessing descend upon us here assembled, and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory, and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of these islands, and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. And this we beg for Jesus Christ, his sake. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Good morning, members. Confirmation of minutes. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Confirmation of minutes. Members, the minutes from the 8th of March as well as the 11th of March have been deferred. Messages from the governor? There are none. Announcements by the speaker? Announcements this morning. We had noticed that the Honorable Member Dunkley will not be present today. I'd also like to use this time to acknowledge in the gallery, this, in, in the chamber for this morning, as former Member of Parliament, John Barrett. Welcome. And I also see a Youth Parliament page this morning. Ms. Corrin, welcome. And we trust you will... Enjoy your sitting here this morning serving the members as uh, page for the Youth Parliament. Messages from the Senate? There are none. Papers and other communications to the House? There are two papers this morning. The first in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, with the Governor's recommendation in accordance with Section 36.3 of the Bermuda Constitution, I have the honor to attach and submit for consideration of the Honorable House of Assembly Government Loans Suspension of Annual Contribution to Sinking Fund Order 2019, proposed to be made by the Minister responsible for Finance under Section 12AA of the Government's Loan Act 1978. Thank you. The second paper of communication is from the Minister of Works. Minister? Morning, Mr. Speaker. Morning. I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the following. The Bermuda Housing Trust financial statements for the year ending March 31st, 2018. Thank you. Petitions? There are none. Statements by ministers? There are four statements on the order paper this morning. The first is in the name of the Premier. Premier, would you like to present your statement? The others are being dis disseminated as we speak. Sergeant of Arms is disseminating the Premier's statement at this moment. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. Mr. Speaker, by now, honorable members of the public will be aware of the decision by the European Council of Finance Ministers, or ECOFIN, to add Bermuda to the list of non-cooperative tax jurisdictions. Mr. Speaker, let me say from the outset that this is a setback for Bermuda, and it is for, that, it is for this reason that I, as the Premier and leader of this government, perceive my colleague, the Honorable Minister in Finance, 
in making this statement to this honorable house and the public. Honorable members will know that for almost two years, the government and a host of technical officers have been devoted to addressing external threats to our jurisdictional operations in the area of financial services. During my tenure as Minister of Finance, and since then, we have been forced to sacrifice many domestic priorities to meet the requirements of, first, an assessment by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, and most recently, the EU's requirements on economic substance. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will recall that the legislature has been taxed with considering and passing almost 50 pieces of legislation or other statutory instruments in support of both of these efforts. This has taxed the operations of several ministries and departments within government and has incurred numerous late nights and long weekends of detailed drafting and policy review. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, at the end of this process on economic substance, a minor technical omissions in our regulations, essentially what appeared as a duplication in almost identical language in our drafts, was unintentionally omitted. Once the omission was discovered, it was immediately addressed. Despite the good faith shown over the last year and our immediate action, the reinsertion of the omitted line appears to not have been good enough for the European Union. Mr. Speaker, there is no value in recriminations or attempt to cast blame. Section 57.2 of our Constitution states the following, and I quote, the cabinet shall be collectively responsible to the legislature for any advice given to the governor by or under the general authority of the cabinet and for all things done by or under the authority of any minister in the execution of his office, end quote. Mr. Speaker, this issue is one for which we must take responsibility. And as the leader of this government, in the legislature to whom the government I lead is collectively responsible, I have no difficulty in saying the buck stops at my desk. Mr. Speaker, Bermuda's inclusion on the EU's list of non-cooperative tax jurisdictions is only temporary. I wish to make clear that as of today, the 13th of March, and in fact, Mr. Speaker, even when this recommendation was made to ministers on the 6th of March, Bermuda was compliant then, and remain so now. This is a technical issue which has already been remedied. Mr. Speaker, I would invite audible members of the public to take note that in just eight weeks or thereabouts, Bermuda will have the opportunity to be removed from the list and have every expectation that this will be done as our existing laws meet the standard required by the European Union. This is a view shared by Her Majesty's Treasury in London who have also expressed the Commission and publicly that they too expect Bermuda to be removed from this list based on our clear compliance with the required stand. Mr. Speaker, this will be a short but challenging period for Bermuda, but I am confident that the bedrock of our decades-old reputation for sound regulation and conducting first-rate business here will survive this latest threat. When this Honorable House became aware of the Reese Report of the Foreign Affairs Committee and the recommendations regarding Bermuda, there was significant force in the unanimity of our political approach to that threat. Mr. Speaker, this is another one of those moments. We cannot let our partisan interests yield to any attempt to divide us as a jurisdiction. This is a together moment, and I look forward to the support of members opposite as we engage with the EU and continue to press Bermuda's case for demonstrated <coughs> compliance. Mr. Speaker, let me close by saying this is clearly not where we want to be. It is not where we intended to be, and we are determined to secure our move from the list of non-cooperative tax jurisdictions. Bermuda remains a jurisdiction of choice, of the best of businesses to operate, and this government will do all that is required to preserve that position. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Premier. The next statement this morning is in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister, would you like to present your statement? Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, um, member, Minister, you can proceed. Mr. Speaker, I rise to provide further background information on the action by the European Union Committee of Finance Ministers, known as the Economic and Financial Affairs Council, or ECOFIN, to include Bermuda, along with several other countries on its list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes. Mr. Speaker, Bermuda is a cooperative jurisdiction with the EU for tax purposes. In the spirit of continued cooperation that has been a hallmark and underpinned Bermuda's international tax cooperation framework over many years, 
The government has legislated to address all technical requirements and has communicated these changes through our written submissions to the EU's Code of Conduct Group on December 28, 2018. Again on February 22nd and on March 4, 2019. And, it and as it stands today, we believe Bermuda has addressed all issues identified and is now fully compliant. Mr. Speaker, I can report that the UK government, a member of ECOFIN, issued a public statement yesterday affirming its position that Bermuda's March 4, 2019 amending submission to the EU met the EU Commission's one remaining concern. Um. Additionally, the, e the UK has published an online note yesterday morning stating, and I quote, the UK, the UK agreement to the Council conclusions on the revised EU list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes is on the basis that, that, as set out in the conclusions, jurisdictions should be removed as soon as possible after they have demonstrated they are compliant. The UK notes that Bermuda has legislated to address the issues identified. In light of this, we expect Bermuda and other compliant jurisdictions to be removed from the list at the next available opportunity. Mr. Speaker, the next meeting of ECOFIN is in May 2019, and in the interim period, we will continue to make sure that member states are clear in that Bermuda is compliant and that our legislation is fully in force and is being implemented. Mr. Speaker, Bermuda is a well-regulated jurisdiction that has met every international standard over many years, and in the coming days and weeks, we will continue to work diligently with our industry partners in order to be removed from this list at the earliest opportunity. Mr. Speaker, contrary to press reports, Bermuda did not, in our submission,
the police service. The first ambition is a new vision and a new set of values for the Bermuda Police Service. As a part of the new vision and values, they will focus on victims to provide a first-class service and be empowered to do the right thing. The newly empowered Bermuda Police Service is striving to serve the community with professionalism, integrity, and compassion. Mr. Speaker, the second of the seven ambitions is to create the right organizational structure to be able to respond to a current and future policing needs. The third ambition is to effectively coordinate, resource, and manage to, and demand risk, uh, and, and the demand and risk. The more information can be shared about the seven ambitions at the, as the BPS continues to roll it out. However, it is with the, this backdrop that the Bermuda Police Service seeks its latest qualified Bermudian candidate. Mr. Speaker, the Bermuda Police Service budget enables the allocation of 422 constables post. There are currently 410. Through retirement, resignations, and natural attrition, the ranks of the Bermuda Police Service stand to fall below 400 by May. If the ranks are not posted through recruitment, excuse me, the, the, the BBS numbers stand to fall by to 400 if the ranks are not bolstered through recruitment. In keeping with this government's mandate, we believe it is important to seek qualified Bermudians to police their own community. There is no better gift to the people of Bermuda than having their very own serve as community stewards. Mr. Speaker, employment with the Bermuda Police, Surf, Bermuda police Service is more than just a job. The Bermuda, Surf, Bermuda Police Service offers a career-oriented and provides vast roles. There is potential for officers to move across the service from Marines to the Marine section to road policing to financial or forensic investigations. Arguably, there is something within the BBS for everyone who cares about the social fabric of Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, others who have passed through the Recruit Foundation course have spoken of the benefits of the course to their career to their, and to their personal lives. Chief Inspector Robert Cardwell stated, the Recruit Foundation course matured me, gave me focus, and solidified my duty and my service to my country. Newly promoted Superintendent Naima Aswood stated, the, Re Re the Recruit Foundation course helped me develop leadership skills. It also gave me a true understanding of teamwork and pushed me beyond my natural boundaries. Through the course, I also developed lifelong friendships. Mr. Speaker, as a Minister of National Security, I believe that we have the opportunity to bolster the ranks of the Bermuda Police Service with Bermudians that are capable, competent, and prepared. Anyone who meets the criteria and is up for the challenge should, apart, should apply to be a part of the solution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next statement on the order this morning is in the name of Minister of Works. Minister. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. I'm pleased to table the Bermuda Housing Trust audited financial statements for the year 2017-2018 and to report that not only are they up to date in their annual audits, but are also in a healthy financial position. Mr. Speaker, this is no accident, but can be attributed to the stellar work of the trustees, ably led by their chairman, former member of this House, the Honorable John Barrett, J.P., mm -hmm and the Deputy Chairman, Senator Vance Campbell, J.P., both of whom are in the chamber this morning. Mr. Speaker, the Trust owns five developments, Elizabeth Hills with 22 units and 21 residents, Hayden Park with 19 units and 23 residents, Purvis Park with 23 units and 25 residents, Ferguson Park with 19 units and 19 residents, and Dr. Ken Park with 100 units and 104 residents, for a total of 183 units and 192 residents. The focus of the trustees in recent years has been on strengthening the financial position of the trust so that its commitment to its tenants, our seniors, of never raising rents on sitting tenants can be achieved. Whatever else happens, those seniors have been able to count on no increase in rents for the duration of their tenancy. Mr. Speaker, Notwithstanding the above commitment, the BHT nonetheless faces increased costs, particularly when it comes to the maintenance of its properties. Provision has to be made each year not only for ongoing regular maintenance, maintenance, but the extraordinary and the unexpected, which occurs regularly 
with an aging housing stock. Some of the units date back to the early 1970s. BHT also continues to carry an outstanding loan taken out in 2006 to help fund the construction of its most recent development, Dr. Ken Park. It was a 10-year construction loan in the amount of $12.5 million. The loan has since been renegotiated with the amount now owing of $6 million. Mr. Speaker, the trustees have consistently paid the loan down and in recent years have made principal payments of up to $200,000 per annum over and above the monthly payments required under the loan. Incidentally, one of the terms of the loan is that BHT, BHT set aside $20,000 a month to build up a maintenance reserve for both the expected and unexpected reserve, unexpected at Dr. Ken Park, and that account currently stands at $800,000. Mr. Speaker, as stated above, BHT currently provides rental homes to close to 200 seniors, but has a consistent waiting list of between 45 to 55 persons. The trustees are therefore acutely aware of the need to develop another property to provide more homes for seniors in need. The mandate of the BHT under its 1965 Act is to initiate and administer one or more schemes for the relief of poverty, suffering, and misfortune among elderly persons in Bermuda by the provision of accommodation for such persons on favorable terms. This mandate has been interpreted over the years to mean that the trust makes accommodation available to those seniors in need who are capable of independent living, i.e. on their own and where appropriate for so long as possible by linking them to supportive community services. Mr. Speaker, with this mandate in mind, the trustees have therefore also been quietly but prudently saving in order to develop a sixth property. The aim in the current and coming years is to launch a major fundraising effort to help realize this goal and to meet this most pressing need, affordable accommodation for Bermuda's largest growing demographic, seniors. To this end, the next project which BHT has initiated is the remediation and renovation of a cottage in Southside St. David's, which is to be converted into two apartments. The house is located on Westcott Lane next to Ferguson Park. This project is a start, a welcome start, to what the Trust has in mind. It is the model of a government trust partnership, a public-private partnership with the Bermuda Housing Corporation who will, will provide technical and oversight support for the project at no cost to the trust. Mr. Speaker, this will help keep the cost down as the trust looks to provide the necessary funding for the actual work. The plan is to continue to use this model on future projects, particularly for the sixth development the trust is about to undertake. Mr. Speaker, it is an ambitious agenda for an organization as small as the BHT that has one full-time office administrator and three part-time staff, providing assistance in various capacities, but who together collectively oversee the trust properties and their resident population. The 10 trustees are all volunteers who have demonstrated their unwavering commitment to our seniors. They are a hardworking and committed group who I would like to publicly thank and commend for their tireless efforts. The Ministry looks forward to developing and expanding this partnership in support of our senior population. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. That brings us to a close of statements. Reports of committees. There are none. Question period. In the question period, members, we have members have indicated they'd like to put questions to ministers in reference to statements this morning. And the first statement that questions have been indicated is the statement from the Premier and the Honourable Member from Constituency 23 would like to put a question to you. Honourable Member, Councillor Gordon, Gordon Pantlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning and good morning to the Premier. Mr. Premier, on page one on your statement, um, could you indicate, um, this is in the uh, penultimate paragraph, could you indicate by whom the omission was discovered. Good morning. Uh, 
Um, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honorable Member for a question. I'm going to refer the Honorable Member back to um, my statement, which states, and I quote again, the Cabinet shall be collected responsible to the Legislature for any advice given to the Governor or by the under general authority of the Cabinet and for all things done or by the authority of any Minister in the execution of his office. I am not going to yeah. stand at this dispatch box right now, Mr. Speaker, and throw any member of the public service under the bus. It is my responsibility. I accept the responsibility on behalf of the government, and that is the way, Mr. Speaker, that I hope that this House will understand. There are hardworking public officers that have done this particular work, and in that, I am not going to disparage any of their efforts in this particular situation. We fell short, and I accept the responsibility here today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Premier. Second question or supplementary? Second question. Okay. Could the minister advise this honorable house what the vetting process was? I'm sorry, the honorable member. Um, advise this honorable house what the vetting process was. I'm not asking for the individual's names. I'm just asking for the process. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, there was significant process that went through with the Attorney General's Chambers, along with uh, private sector partners in the Insurance Advisory Council, um, and numerous drafts and different things were shared with them back and forth. On this particular issue, and I'll make it clear again, there was an editing matter there where there was a line, two lines that appeared almost exactly identical, and the editor managed to... Um, not realize that the two lines were similar, went to, and this was an issue where people, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I said and indicated, that it was an error. It was a technical omission. I'm just going to read the two lines so that honorable members can understand. These were the two lines from the particular legislation. One said, taking the strategic decisions and managing and bearing the principal risks related to the development and subsequent exploitation of IP assets. The second line said, taking the strategic decisions and managing and bearing the principal risks related to any third-party acquisition and subsequent exploitation of the IP assets. Those were the two lines that one of those lines were omitted, and in one of those lines being omitted, as the editor had thought that they were the same line and had the same intent, led to this decision, Mr. Speaker. When this was picked up, it was immediately reinserted, and that is where we find ourselves now, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary, further questions? Yes. Supplementary? Su supplementary. Yes. Just bearing that in mind, I, I um, just want to get from the Premier. So, um, in understanding uh, how this is all taking place, I think it was clear, we want to be clear that um, we picked it up as opposed to, to the EU picking up it up. That, that's really what we're looking for. Was it us who picked it up, or was it the EU who picked up the It sounds as if you're saying it was us, but I'm, it's not clear. Thank you. Premier? Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to get back to the Minister with specific clarifications on that particular issue. Okay. Thank you. No further questions? Uh, third question or supplementary? I have a third question, third question, Mr. Speaker. Could the Honorable Premier advise what was the initial stated deadline for the submission? <laughs> the initial deadline was the end of December. Countries submitted their legislation by the end of December. The Code of Conduct Group met in uh, January, went back to jurisdictions with different uh, things and said to come back by February 24th. Our items were submitted in good time. As I had indicated to members yesterday at my press conference and today, there was a minor technical omission. That minor technical omission was picked up and we resubmitted those particular issues. Um, let's be very clear, Mr. Speaker. The only thing in which we're dealing with is that particular line of which I read out. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes, I have a supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the resubmission was on the 4th of March, I believe, which was well outside the 22nd of, uh, sorry, 24th of February deadline that the, um, that the member just indicated. So my supplementary question is, <coughs> excuse me, in the interim between the 24th and the 4th of March, did we have an internal recap in terms of vetting what was submitted to ensure that we were compliant with what was expected, notwithstanding the technical glitch? I understand that. Just want to know what backdrop 
support did we have to ensure that what had been submitted on the 24th of February was accurate, given that it is of no consequence when the EU meeting occurred if we failed to meet the deadline? Premier. Mr. Speaker, I'm not entirely certain how many more times I can say it, but I'm going to try and say it again. What took place in this particular process were multiple reviews that took place by multiple persons and individuals. That is what took place. There was numerous working groups between the Insurance Advisory Council, private sector, public sector, attorney general chambers, back and forth. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, that this particular line was missed. When that was done, there are numerous reviews. So a simple answer to the honorable member's question is yes, but let us be clear. What took place, what has been stated by members, the United Kingdom, etc., is that the regulations which are in front of the European Union right now are compliant with what was necessary. The only issue of compliance, and there has been numerous back and forth with the European Commission, was this one line, Mr. Speaker. I'm not entirely certain how many more times that I can say that, and I'm not many more certain how many more times I can stand up here to this honorable member and say that I'm not going to throw any civil servants or others under the bus, and I accept responsibility for this on behalf of the government, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Second supplementary? Yes, second and final on mm -hmm. this matter, because I realize it's very testy for the country. Um, the final overview of the documentation, um, notwithstanding we had various people responsible, various organizations responsible, is there a process for future lessons that a final overview is conducted, and if so, by whom? Members, members, members. The honorable member asks, is there a process? The answer is yes. Thank you. That brings us to a close of the questions for the first statement. The second statement that members have indicated I'd like to put questions is a statement from the Minister of Finance. And, Minister, the member would like to ask a question is a member from Constituency 12, Opposition Leader. You have the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on page four, um, says Mr. Speaker, Bermuda has moved swiftly to request an official response uh, from the Commission. Um, I was hoping uh, just to make a suggestion uh, as a question, uh, if we could ask them why could they not have just left us on the gray list, understanding that we had made the uh, submission uh, before they actually did meet. Uh, it would suggest that they didn't see the submission potentially by putting us on the list. Uh, by uh, March 12th when they met. I, I, I would like to ask you if you could ask them why could they not have just left us on the gray list uh, as opposed to this threat of a black list? Minister? Mr. Speaker, I think the short answer to that is I can ask that question. We are still awaiting to receive formal communications from the EU with respect to our listing, which we haven't received yet. We learned this information through the press and through our contacts at HMT yesterday. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes, just a supplementary. supplementary? Yes. Um, the Minister indicating having learned this information through the press, what is the expected exchange of information um, that the press would have gotten it before we did? Minister? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The, the Honourable Member, I will let her, let her know that throughout the course of the last uh, 10 days, there have been uh, various press reports around Bermuda's listing, inclusion, not inclusion, uh, all, I suspect, the result of leaks coming out of Europe. Um, I, I can't speak to their process. I would have expected to have received uh, official communications with respect to our listing. We have not, as of yet, or as of this morning at, at this point, uh, and I can check with my office, have not received anything formal yet, um, but we've relied upon what we've seen in the press because there was a, a published list there was a streaming of the meeting yesterday on, on, uh, on the web, and then we've had uh, direct contact with, uh, with our UK representatives. Second supplementary. Second supplementary. Um, the minister indicated that he had direct contact with our UK representatives, but have you had any direct contact, perhaps through our Brussels office, directly with the ECOFIN individuals? Or are you just still waiting for the written 
confirmation of what they have made the determination. Minister. We are awaiting uh, formal written communications from Brussels. Thank you. No further supplementaries. That brings us to a close of the question period because there are no questions for the other statements that were made this morning. But before we move on, let me just acknowledge, that even though it was mentioned, let me officially acknowledge that Senator Campbell is in the, in the gallery offices this morning, and we welcome you. And also, um, it was omitted when I made announcements earlier that the deputy opposition leader will be absent today and Friday. So I'd just like to have that officially noted as well. Congratulatory and or obituary speech. Would any member wish to speak to that? We recognize the Honorable Member Minister De Silva. Minister, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like the House to uh, send condolences to the family of Mr. Bernard Bernie Woods, who mm -hmm. passed away yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Woods, as you may know, Mr. Speaker, worked uh, as a bus driver for, for many several, years. Yes, many several years. decades. Yes. And of course, was um, some may say the mayor, and we have several mayors up in Sunnyside Park in mm -hmm. Southampton. Um, so I certainly um, <clears throat> uh, hope that. Um, the House will send condolences to the family, in particular to his wife, Jersey, and children, Bernie and Juanita. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Member. Does any other Honourable Member wish to speak? No other Honourable Member speaking this morning? That brings us to a close of con uh, congratulations and obituary speeches. Matters of privilege. There are none. Personal explanation. There are none. Notice of motions for the adjournment of the House on matters of urgent public importance. There are none. Introduction of bills. There are three government bills to be introduced this morning, and the first is in the name of the Honorable Minister of Finance. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm introducing the following bill, which according to Section 36.3 of the Bermuda Constitution requires the Governor's recommendation so that it may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting. The Customs Tariff Amendment Number Two Act 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The next, in fact, the next two under the name of the Minister Wilson. Minister, would you like to do yours? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm introducing the following bill for its first reading so that it may be placed in the order paper for the next day of meeting, namely the Liquor License Amendment Act 2019. And I'm also introducing, Mr. Speaker, for the following bill for its first reading so that it may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting, namely the Dental Practitioners Amendment Act 2019. Thank you, Minister. Orders of the day. Orders of the day. And again, for the uh, listening public, we're today resuming the continued debate on the budget. And with the consideration of the estimates and revenues. And this morning, the first ministry up for debate is that of legal affairs. And there are some four hours set aside for that. And then the, after that, we'll continue with the debate, the, which will be for the, the Ministry of Labor and Sport. At this time, Minister of Finance, would you like to move us? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House do now resume in Committee of Supply to consider the estimates of revenue and expenditure for 2019-2020. Any objections to that? No objections? So moved. Uh, heads 87, Ministry of Legal Affairs Headquarters. Uh, head 3, Judicial Department. Uh, head 23, Child and Family Services. And Head 4, Attorney General's Chambers. Thank you, Minister. The Chairman for this morning's session can... Come forward now.
good morning. We are in the Committee of Supply, and we are resuming the debate. Uh, today we'll, we will be debating legal affairs, heads 87, 3, 23, and 4. Four hours will be dedicated to this ministry, and the debate will be led by the junior Minister of Legal Affairs, the Honorable Kim. I'm not. Spokesperson. Spokesperson. My apologies. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move the following heads, namely 87, Ministry of Legal Affairs, Headquarters, Number 3, Judicial Department, 23, Child and Family Services, and 4, Attorney General's Chambers, take, be now taken under consideration. Mr. Chair, I am actually, as you can see, holding this matter on behalf of the Honorable and Learned Attorney General, who does sit in another chamber. The Ministry of Legal Affairs, under the direction of the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Senator the Honorable Kathy Lynn Simmons, is charged with the responsibility of upholding the Constitution and the legal system of Bermuda. The Ministry's mission statement, department objectives, and current account expenditures can be located at page B80 of the budget book, and its mission statement is as follows. To provide the fair administration of and access to justice while strengthening and promoting the well-being and protection of children, adults, and families through rehabilitation, prevention, and treatment services. The department objectives, Mr. Chair, are as follows. For headquarters, to advance government policy initiatives under the direction of the Minister of Legal Affairs, to ensure the government's legislative framework is updated and current with policy directives, and to effect synergies amongst ministry departments to ensure that overall policy objectives are met. Mr. Chairman, the, department that, excuse me, the departments that come under the umbrella of the ministry are as follows. The Legal Affairs Headquarters, Judiciary, Attorney General's Chambers, Department of Court Services, Department of Public Prosecutions, Department of Child and Family Services, and the Department of National Drug Control. With respect to the current expenditure, Mr. Chair, that can be found in the budget book commencing at pages B76 of the approved estimates of revenue and expenditure for the years 2019-20. Mr. Chair, the budget ceiling of $49,071,000 was allocated to the entire ministry for the 2019-20 fiscal year. This amount represents $1,167,000, or 2% increase from the current 2018-19 fiscal year. A comprehensive analysis of the ministry's expenditure was undertaken to strike a balance between optimizing spending limits without compromising the efficient delivery of services. Of the $49,071 allocated to the ministry, particular allocations are as follows. Ministry Headquarters, $6,627,000. Judicial Department, $8,723,000. Attorney General's Chambers, $5,308,000. Department of Court Services, $4,658,000. Department of Public Prosecutions, $3,329,000. The Department of Child and Family Services, $15,915,000 and the Department of National Drug Control, $4,511,000. With respect to revenue, Mr. Chair, the only departments under the ministry's portfolio that have a mandate to generate revenue are the Judicial Department and the Department of Child and Family Services. Their combined revenue is projected to be $10,403,000. This amounts to $1,405,000 more than the 2018-19 original estimates. Mr. Chair, the current account expenditure, expenditure estimates for Head 87 with respect to the Ministry of Legal Affairs Headquarters begins at page B80 of the budget book. A total of $6,627,000 has been allocated to the Ministry Headquarters. This represents an increase of $909,000 or 16% from the 2018-19 original estimates. The increase is mainly due to the budget allocation of $906,000 for the MIRS program. It will be transferred to the ministry commencing the 1st of April 2019, and it is not reflected in the original estimates of 2018-19. 
In addition, resources were diverted to increase funding for services that would be performed by the litigation guardians, net of a small decrease in the funds allocated to other overhead costs within the ministry. Legal service costs also have decreased due to effect of reform of the legal aid model. Mr. Chair, $6,627,000 has been allocated to the ministry headquarters, $2,355,000 or 36% of the budgeted amount represents the allocation for salaries. This includes salaries for ministry headquarters, the legal aid office, the financial sanctions implementation unit, and the mayor's program. And the specific details of these figures are as follows. Mr. Chair, point of information. Yes. I'm afraid I haven't been provided with a copy of the minister's brief, so I'd be grateful if she could bear in mind that I'm trying to take a note. Thank you. I appreciate it's not a requirement, but I'd be grateful. Uh, she's galloping through this, and I'd be grateful. I'm trying to take a note. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Minister? $724,000 represents the ministry headquarters. $829,000 is the legal aid office. $324,000 is the Financial Sanctions Implementation Unit, and $478,000 is the MIRS program. Mr. Chair, $1,866,000, or 28% of the Ministry Headquarters budget, is allocated to professional services. Budgeting is for external legal counsel retained by the Legal Aid Office of $660,000. Also included in the professional services allocation is a budget of $554,000 for the Justice Protection Program. This program continues to produce excellent dividends for Bermuda by contributing to the successful prosecution and conviction of criminals. Also included in professional services is funding allocated for litigation guardians in the amount of $242,000 to ensure the independent representation of children during court proceedings. Further funding in the amount of $105,000 has been provided towards public relations via a communications officer on behalf of the ministry. Funding in the amount of $143,000 will enable the mayor's program to avail itself of required consultants. Mr. Chair, the Ministry of Legal Affairs headquarters is furthermore functionally subdivided into six fiscally identifiable programs as follows. Uh, cost out of 97000 administration, 97010 financial intelligence agency, 97030 legal aid, 97070 justice protection, 97080 financial sanctions implementation unit, and 97090 MIRAS program. And I will proceed to address them individually as follows. Administration. Line item 97000. This program provides for the administrative costs associated with the Ministry of Headquarters to which $1,338,000 has been allocated. This represents an increase in the sum of $389,000 or 41% from the 2018-19 original estimates. The increase is mainly due to the funding allocated for litigation guardian fees and one communications officer. Included in the Administration Cost Center are salaries and related costs for Ministry Headquarters. Administrative support for the Minister and Permanent Secretary is provided by one secundant Executive Assistant and one Administrative Assistant. Policy formation for Ministry Legislative Initiatives and Project Management is provided by a Policy Analyst. Fiscal and Financial Control is provided by a Ministry Controller. Mr. Chair, the Ministry Headquarters intends to continue to focus on the codification and efficient delivery of throne speech initiatives. Our Ministry's most recent commitments include the vital role in, that is to be played in realizing the medicinal and economic benefits of medical cannabis, modernizing Bermuda's liquor licensing regime to meet the challenges confronting us, and needed court reform to address the pressing social challenges of setting, settling excuse me, family law disputes. Moving from limited decriminalization of cannabis to laying the framework of a medical cannabis industry entails overcoming many hurdles. Our government is responsive to the increasing numbers of medical professionals embracing the science surrounding cannabis and its positive impact on pain relief and the management of chronic medical conditions. 
The ministry is progressing with advancing the regime whereby licensed medical practitioners are permitted to prescribe medical cannabis to aid in the treatment of such conditions. In its 2017 platform, the government promised to allow licensed practitioners to prescribe their patients medicinal cannabis to address legitimate health issues and establish a regime for domestic medical medicinal cannabis production. Mr. Chair, the government has already delivered on a platform promise that targeted removing the criminal offense for possession, simple possession by any person who held seven grams or less of cannabis. In this 2019-2020 budget year, the ministry intends to advance from limited decriminalization of cannabis to also establish a robust licensing regime that will create a comprehensive framework that embraces the science of cannabis use for medicinal purposes. Legal aid reform has moved into the implementation phase where we are already experiencing projected cost savings results to be enhanced with further implementation. This is the outcome of our commitment to minimizing outsourcing legal aid services, legal services where feasible, and to reap the benefits of handling matters in-house with added staff that pays dividends as compared to the considerably costier option of outsourcing as was blindly committed to in the past. Liquor licensing reform is well underway to strike the right balance between the commercial benefits of sell selling alcohol and responsible consumption. Our current liquor licensing regime is as cumbersome and dated as should be expected for having been originally fashioned in 1974. Accordingly, in keeping with government's commitment, legislation is well underway to modernize the mechanisms and the process by which liquor licenses are granted. This will also expand classes of licenses enhance enforcement and provide a balanced approach that promotes health and safety to the community while supporting businesses and our tourism product. In the 2019-2020 budget year, the Ministry of Legal Affairs will further introduce amendments that are designed to improve and modernize the functioning of the Liquor Licensing Authority under the Liquor License Act 1974. It remains the duty of a responsible government to ensure that adequate protections exist in law to administer the sale and consumption of alcohol in the best interest of the whole society. The gaps identified in the liquor licensing regime are preventing businesses from legally serving alcohol at certain events, and it is anticipated that amendments to the law will decrease the practice of serving alcohol without the proper authorization. Having passed sex offender legislation to protect society and especially our children, work continues a pace to coordinate stakeholders and to implement the sex offender registration and notification system. The work with the Joint Select Committee was carefully considered to ensure a bipartisan approach to the measures ultimately implemented. As a result, we now have a comprehensive registration, rehabilitation, monitoring, and reporting system under the auspices of an offender risk management team with this primary mandate. The aim is to ensure that all necessary steps are taken for offenders to be reformed once incarcerated and appropriately monitored and supervised upon release. Appropriate notices will also be provided to victims and the public to prevent reoffending with particular regard to the safety of our children. Mr. Chair, the ministry's commitment to providing opportunities to train Bermudians next generation of lawyers continues apace. Our pupilage program provides pupils with an opportunity to work under the supervision of a designated barrister known as a pupil master. The pupil is thereby trained, provided the training and experience within a number of different areas within the ministry. This includes the Department of Public Prosecutions and Legal Aid Department, where they gain criminal law experience, the Civil Advisory Section of the Attorney General's Chambers, where they gain experience in civil litigation and advice, and the Drafting Section of the Attorney General's Chambers, where they are taught the process of how the law is made. In 2018, four pupils were selected to participate in the program, and it is anticipated that each will be given the opportunity to become proficient in an array of legal disciplines. The pupils have been placed on a rotation schedule and have been given the opportunity to assist with files, attend court, and gain experience with the type of work for which the pupil master has responsibility in, in addition to any other persons within the ministry who the pupil master may assign the pupil to. Throughout the pupilage period, the pupils work under close monitoring and supervision of their pupil masters. They are provided with required assistance and the opportunity to discuss complex legal matters to ensure that their pupillage is progressing appropriately and meet, if not exceed, the requirements of the Bermuda Bar Association's pupillage guidelines. These guidelines require that a number of practice areas are covered during the pupillage, such as legal research, problem analysis, and fact investigation 
planning and conducting of a matter, and file and practice management. The program is proceeding efficiently, and it is anticipated that a positive pupilage experience will continue to endear pupils to recommend others to pursue a legal career within the ministry, thereby offering preferential opportunity to recruit new talent. And finally, Mr. Chair, child support arrears enforcement remains a challenging priority related to unifying the family court to fully marshal mediation and case management to resolving family law disputes. Resources will be deployed to implement a unified family court and mediation center to better assist families in crisis and decrease dependency on an adversarial system. The stress of litigation will be further offset by streamlined case management to further minimize protracted disputes in family matters. The intended single registrar office promotes better trained professionals at entry level. This restorative justice approach is long overdue to assist children and families faced with the daunting challenge of resolving disputes without damaging the society, social bonds that de depend upon. Excuse me. In 2019-20, the Ministry of Legal Affairs, as described in the 2018 throne speech, will progress the Unified Family Court and Mediation Center to provide coordinated services to those who have family-related matters within the judicial system. Restorative justice will be fully integrated to progress cases involving children and families in a fair, efficient, and cost-effective manner. It is anticipated that this platform will assist to empower families through appropriate skills development activities and sound case management practices to resolve disputes. Turning now to line item 97030, the Legal Aid Office. Mr. Chair, the Legal Aid Office purpose is, quote, to ensure that legal advice and representation is readily available to those who need it most and who, because of limited financial means, would otherwise be unable to secure access to justice, end of quote. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Um, the Legal Aid Office's mission statement is to provide high-quality legal representation to those who qualify for assistance under the Legal Aid Act of 1980. The office aims to achieve this by providing qualified clients with accessible and professional legal services in a timely and efficient manner. Mr. Chair, the Legal Aid Scheme, which is administered by the Legal Aid Committee under the authority of the Legal Aid Act 1980, is allocated for the 2019-2020 budget $1,684,000, which is a 19% or $389,000 decrease from the 2018-19 original estimate allocation. The decrease in the budgetary needs from the 2018-19 is primarily attributable to less funding being allocated to legal services. This results from in-house legal aid counsel taking conduct of many cases that would otherwise have been allocated to outside counsel at a higher cost per case. The private bar still remain a role, retains a role in the operation of the legal aid scheme, but the implementation of the public policy-based cost controls has reduced this area of expenditure. Of the 2019-2020 allocation, $829,000, or 49%, represents salaries for the administrative and management team. $660,000, or 39%, represent costs allocated for legal services. And the remaining $195,000, or 12%, represents administrative expenses other than salaries for the Legal Aid Office. Mr. Chair, the Legal Aid Office has focused primarily on increased operational control over client litigation and administrative efficiency. The reduction of expenditure where possible has been a primary concern, but not at the expense of a reduction in the quality of legal services. Mr. Chair, the largest area of expenditure within the Legal Aid budget remains the legal fees, which is keeping with historical trends. The office has, was able to contain spending within its budget of 2018-19 through prudent management coupled with the cost reduction and budget control initiatives outlined previously. The transition to the reformed legal aid model, which commenced in June of 2018 and continues underway. To date, one of three legal counsel has been employed to decrease previously outsourced work. Although full staff is not yet in place, 
from the period June 1st, 2018 to December 31st, 2018, legal fees paid to external counsel amounted to $996,000. This compares to the annual average cost for the immediately preceding two-year period of $1,020,500. It is anticipated that costs will continue to trend downward in tandem with full implementation of the reformed model. Mr. Chair, with respect to legal services, between the period 1st of April 2018 and 31st of August 2018, the Legal Aid Office managed a combined total of 105 new cases, new matters. 13 were domestic matters, 7 matrimonial matters, 30 were civil matters, and 55 criminal matters. The Legal Aid Office continues to maintain a general roster of counsel from private practice who provide legal services to persons granted legal aid certificates, notwithstanding that in-house counsel also absorbs a percentage of the caseload. For the period 1st of April 2018 to January 31st, 2019, 80 counsel, including two Queens counsel representing 40 law firms, were listed on the legal aid roster. The current initiative to reform the legal aid service delivery model will be as follows. One, increase sustainability. Two, provide employment and training opportunities for Bermudian counsel. Three, improve succession planning. And finally, significantly reduce expenditure on legal fees, which has historically been an area of budget overspend. The Legal Aid Office continues to be a major stakeholder in the specialist court programs, such as the Drug Court and the Mental Health Treatment Court, providing defense counsel for these courts. In addition to the traditional roster of counsel participating in the Legal Aid Scheme and duty counsel managed and maintained by the Legal Aid Office, small rosters are also in place for these specialist courts. If in-house counsel is not available, private practice counsel who are competent in these areas will be utilized. The Legal Aid Office also produced a comprehensive legal aid policies and procedures guidelines document relevant to these courts, which was released to the members of the Bermuda Bar Association for circulation to its members in July of last year. This provides a useful reference guide to counsel who currently participate in these courts and who may wish to join, who, and those who may wish to join. The Bar also has included a designated legal aid section on its website for ease of access. Mr. Chairman, the output measures. The Legal Aid Office retains the ability to process applications for legal aid certificates within 14 working days. However, achieving this objective is dependent on whether applicants have submitted the required information in a timely manner. One of the primary areas of delay was a lack of information from applicants as to the precise nature of the assistance that they were seeking. We have modified the application process to address this concern. The Legal Aid Office continues to process applications for temporary certificates commonly known as emergency certificates, within three working days. This is feasible once all relevant financial information is submitted at the time of application, and the applications for emergency certificates can be approved, provided that they are capped below a certain amount and are ratified by the committee within 28 days. With respect to staffing, Mr. Chairman, at present, the Legal Aid Office is comprised of three administrative posts and three legal posts. The three administrative posts are the office manager, accounts assistant, and an administrative assistant. The three legal posts are senior legal aid counsel, a paralegal, and a law pupil. In the coming months, more staff will be added to this complement, consisting of two more counsel, which will bring the eventual number to three. These three counsel will attend court and represent clients at a reduced cost to the public purse, since they will be on salary as opposed to drawing an hourly fee rate. We expect to see appreciable savings using this model. Training and development. The Legal Aid Office has as one of its primary objectives to be focused not only on present service provision, but also development of the quality of the advocates who appear in court on behalf of our clients. To this end, the research and library facilities at the Legal Aid Office are being revamped. This is necessary to support the litigation that will now be carried out carried on out of that office because for the first time legal aid counsel will be not simply managing the scheme as an administrative level but they will also have conduct of the serious cases at the Supreme Court such as murders and firearms matters. This broadening of the scope of the work done by legal aid counsel will provide ripe opportunities for rapid growth and the acquisition of valuable experience. There will eventually be two junior counsel who will work under the guidance of the senior legal aid counsel. Training on the office's case management system, LegalFies, was also recently conducted for all staff to develop their competency on the system, as well as to keep them abreast of updates. 
legal file system is the database we use to track client information, case disposition, classification, and cost of each case that we have conduct of. The diversity of legal work in the Legal Aid Office makes it an attractive option for pupils, two of which I understand are joined here in the gallery now, law students as well as summer students. It is integral to facilitating the ministry's thrust to train and retain competent and qualified Bermudians. At present, there is a roster which allows pupils to spend time working in all the relevant government legal environments on rotation, at the end of which they will be able to draw on a wide base of knowledge and eventually choose a specialization area and settle into practice. Mr. Chair, other initiatives are as follows. Legislative amendments. Amendments to the legal aid legislation will be considered during the upcoming fiscal year with respect to the calculation of disposable income and to take into account the cost of living increases. This will be coupled with the implementation of clear guidelines on the categories of cases that will qualify for coverage, those categories themselves being a reflection of a balance between the principle of access to justice on the one hand and reasonable use of public funds on the other. CLE requirements for counsel participating in the legal aid scheme. CLE is the continuing legal, aid, legal education. An agreement has been reached between the Bermuda Bar Association and the Legal Aid Office to ensure that counsel participating in the scheme will be trained to have full understanding of the legal aid policies, procedures, and general expectations of counsel undertaking legal matters. Existing counsel who wish to undertake legal work must attend one mandatory continuing education training session per year hosted by the association in order to retain, be retained on the legal aid roster. Additionally, those counsel who undertake a certain amount of legal aid work per year are granted a discount on the fees payable for their practicing certificates. Mr. Chair, the Justice Protection Program, that is at line item 97070. The Justice Protection Program has been allocated a budget of $554,000 for the fiscal year 1920, and this represents $3,000 more than the prior year 2018-19. This program is operated pursuant to the Justice Protection Act 2010 and provides protection for witnesses who support the prosecution process and meet the legislative requirements for entry into the program. The success of this legislative initiative is apparent from the increase in successful prosecutions, particularly those that are gang-related and involve violent offenders similar to uh, within other jurisdictions. Financial Sanctions Implementation Unit. Mr. Chair, this is cost item 97080. The Financial Sanctions Implementation Unit, or the FSIU, is a new unit, and it was established subsequent to the transfer of the Office of NEMLAC to the Ministry of Finance. Of the 2019-20 allocation, $324,000, or 95%, represents salary and administration. The remaining $16,000, or 5%, represents overhead costs for setting up the new office. The FSIU was formally established in September 2018. The history of this dates, uh, unit dates back quite some time. The current and previous administration have discussed the importance of the establishment of this unit as the country was preparing for the on-site mutual evaluation by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, which is a regional body that is linked to the Financial Action Task Force. The unit oversees the implementation and the close monitoring of financial sanctions in Bermuda and also advises the Minister of Legal Affairs of wider matters relating to anti-money laundering and the financing of terrorism. Mr. Chair, the governor is the competent authority in Bermuda responsible for the implementation of financial sanctions. His powers are set out in the various overseas territories orders that are enforced in Bermuda pursuant to the International Sanctions Act 2003, as well as the International Sanctions Regulations of 2013. The governor, by way of the International Sanctions Delegation of Governor's Powers Notice 2018, transferred certain functions to the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs which took effect on the 25th of September, 2018. Mr. Chair, it must be noted that the United Kingdom retains overall responsibility for the external affairs of Bermuda and that the special responsibility of the governor for external affairs and defense under Section 62 of the Constitution of Bermuda is in no way affected by the delegation of these powers that I just spoke about. In particular, under the said orders, the Minister of Legal Affairs has the power to do the following. A, obtain evidence and information by taking such steps as considered appropriate to cooperate with any international investigation relating to the funds, economic resources, or financial transactions of a designated person. 
B, issue and revoke licenses with the consent of the Secretary of State and may grant a license authorizing an activity that would otherwise be prohibited under the set orders, and such license can be varied or revoked by the minister at any time with the consent of the Secretary of State. C, serve as a reporting depository to whom a re relevant institution reports or informs if it has credits that are frozen accounts or pursuant to an order. D, authorize persons with power to search and investigate suspected ships, aircrafts, and vehicles. And E, specify by regulation in the currency of the territory the amount which is to be taken as equivalent to sums expressed in sterling in the relevant order. Mr. Chair, the FSIU provides support to the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs in carrying out the functions that have been delegated by the Governor. The FSIU also provides the necessary infrastructure to effectively implement targeted financial sanctions, as well as provides support to the Minister of Legal Affairs in respect of her statutory functions regarding implementing implementation of government's anti-money laundering initiatives. With respect to the output measures, Mr. Chair, the FSIU ensures that the sanctions measures web page of the government portal is updated with regard to adding or delisting for the various sanctions regimes. Thus, upon notification from HM Treasury's office, the FSIU updates the web page within 24 hours and also notifies the supervisors to immediately advise their supervised entities. In addition, the FSIU will be engaging in outreach to relevant government ministries and departments as well as with industry to increase awareness and provide information regarding obligations under Bermuda's sanctions regime and the role of the FSIU in implementing targeted financial sanctions. The FSIU is also keeping a watching brief on Brexit and should the need arise, will work with UK authorities and operational partners to ensure Bermuda's sanctions regime is functioning efficiently and effectively. With respect to the staff of the FSIU, currently it is comprised of a responsible head and recruitment is underway to fill the position of legal counsel. Administrative support is provided by headquarters as needed. The head is responsible for implementing targeted financial sanctions, including bringing relevant overseas territories, orders, and counsel into force in Bermuda, reviewing license applications in respect of the various sanctions regimes, liaison with government house and UK authorities on sanctions matters, and assisting headquarters with Bermuda's mutual evaluation process. During the period, the head has been assisted by legal counsel who was seconded to the legal counsel post by the Attorney General's chambers. Mr. Chair, training and development. The FSIU benefited from training from Her Majesty's Treasury Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation in July of last year. The um, OFSI team members conducted a two-day training session on financial sanctions implementations, implementation that provided infrastructure and structure, excuse me, instructive information and practical ex exercises on dealing with financial sanctions implementation. Further, the head attended meetings of the OFSI in January 2019 and met with the OFSI's director and heads of the various units in order to gain more insight into the effective implementation of targeted financial sanctions. In addition, OFSI will be conducting meetings with the UK's overseas territories in Miami in March 2019, mm -hmm. and the FSIU will attend and lead a session on the implementation of targeted financial sanctions and share Bermuda's experience in respect of having certain functions delegated by, from the governor to the minister. Attorney 9 to Cost Center 97090, which is the mayor's program. The mayor's program is newly transferred to the Ministry of Legal Affairs as a result of the cabinet shuffle. Of its 2019-20 budget, $906,000 has been allocated. $478,000, or 53%, represent salaries for administration. The remaining $428,000, or 47%, represents overhead cost. This program is focused on social emotional skills development, performance coaching, and personal transformation for middle and senior school students with an emphasis on innovative learning strategies and leadership skills. MIRS programs are based on creating a deep and lasting transformation in the lives of participants so they can reach their fullest potential. The long-term objective is to make better learners and build a resistant community of young adults who have positive life outcomes in education, employment, and lawfulness. 
There, has, there will be a reduction in the number of students served from 36 senior school students to 22 for the 2019-2020 fiscal year, and the shift in traveling overseas to a university settling for camp services versus hosting the residential camp locally. This change is a more cost-effective way of providing services whilst building students' leadership skills, allowing them to interact with overseas students and have a college campus life experience. The limited venues locally and rising costs for conference and housing services would not be sustainable in the long term. Mr. Chair, the Mayor's Alumni and Friends Association will support the Mayor's program to launch the Peer Forward College Summit program for fiscal year 2019-20 with a grant from Skyport. Peer Forward mobilizes students to create a college-going culture in their high school. The Peer Forward method guides more students to college by tapping the peer resources in high schools. It is an informed and validated by research on the key actions essential for post-secondary degree attainment. Peer Forward trains, deploys, and coaches a team of peer leaders who are charged with <laughs> boosting college preparation and enrollment across their entire school. They mobilize friends and classmates to realize their true college and career potential. Grants. Mr. Chair, the budget allocation for grants for fiscal 2019-20 can be found at page C16 of the budget book. For fiscal 2019-18, a grant will be provided to the Financial Intelligence Agency. In continuation of government's efforts to combat money laundering and terrorist financing, the FIA has, was established under the Financial Intelligence Agency Act of 2007. The FIA is the independent agency authorized to receive, gather, store, analyze, and disseminate information relating to suspected money laundering and financing of terrorism, which it is received in, form, in the form of a suspicious activity report. Mm. The FIA is empowered to disseminate such information to the Bermuda Police Service and to foreign intelligence authorities. $1,805,000 was allocated for fiscal 1920, which represents an amount that was retained from the same previous fiscal year of 1819. The statutory mandate of the FIA dictates that the agency must report its quarterly expenditure and provides an annual audited report to the Minister of Legal Affairs. Capital expenditure estimates. The budget allocation for capital expenditures is found at page C9 of the budget book. The ministry has been allocated a total of $260,000 for fiscal year 1920. $249,000 is allocated for video conferencing, and the remaining $11,000 is intended to be used to purchase fully depreciated assets with no residual value for departments under the ministry. And finally, Mr. Chair, it is anticipated that the Ministry of Legal Affairs headquarters budget allocations of 2019-20, as detailed, will enable the ministry to successfully fulfill its mandate with careful monitoring and the continuing exercise of financial prudence. This completes Head 87, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chair, turning now to... Head 03, the Judiciary, that can be located, Mr. Chair, in the budget book at... B85. Thank you. The Judiciary is established by the Constitution as a separate and independent branch of government. Its task is to adjudicate charges of criminal conduct, resolve disputes, uphold the rights and freedoms of the individual, and preserve the rule of law. The mission of the judiciary is to carry out its task fairly, justly, and expeditiously, and to abide by the requirement of the judicial oath, quote, to do right by all manner of people without fear or favor, affection or ill will, end of quote. Mr. Chair, the mission of the administrative section of the judiciary is to provide the services and support necessary to enable the judiciary to achieve its mission. The judicial system of Bermuda consists of the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court, which has the criminal, civil, commercial, appellant, family, and matrimonial courts, as well as the probate registry, and the magistrate's court, which has the criminal, civil, and family courts. Ancillary activities involve bailiff services and administrative support for judicial chairs of statutory boards such as the liquor and betting licenses and criminal injuries compensation. 
The Honorable Chief Justice is the head of the judiciary. The Registrar is the head of the Judicial Department, which can employ, when fully staffed, up to 70 officers, none of whom require a work permit. There are currently 53 or 76 percent substantive posts filled, 9 or 13 percent posts filled by temporary relief employees, and 8 or 11 percent posts are vacant. The goal is to be at full complement by the end of 2019. This is quite a turnaround from last year when a severe shortage in staff resulted in partial closure of the courts and registries. I am pleased to say that all courts and registries are once again operating under normal hours. The major shift in the increase in staffing numbers was due to the push to obtain temporary relief staff. The budget for this department in the upcoming year is approximately $873,000, and revenues are projected at $10,211,000. Some of the highlights from the 2018-19 year, Mr. Chair. The Judicial Department gives thanks to the Permanent Secretary, Ms. Marva Jean O'Brien, and the Department of Human Resources for their assistance and support in helping the department fill the vacant posts. The court accommodation being placed under one roof would increase service efficiency. The closure of 113 Front Street location has had an impact on service delivery of the courts. It is a priority to find suitable relocation space for administrative staff, such as the judges' chambers, as well as suitable, secure, and separate jury space and court operations. The staff of the Judicial Department are to be commended for continuing to provide services to the public. Video conferencing. Mr. Chair, the Evidence Audio-Visual Link Act of 2018 was passed, and now capital funding for the 2019-20 fiscal year has been allocated to the Department to move forward with the installation of the required technology. This initiative would not, not only enable significant cost savings, but also to provide vulnerable witnesses more protection in sensitive cases. Furthermore, the ability for expert witnesses to attend via an audiovisual link would also decrease the cost to legal aid in instances where overseas experts are needed to be flown into Bermuda to provide evidence. The implementation of this technology will provide an Im Im immense benefit towards the modernization of the judiciary. The Department would like to thank the Minister for assisting in this initiative. Further education. While we continue to encourage staff to challenge themselves and to grow in knowledge and expertise, the staff shortages greatly reduce opportunity for additional training as all hands were needed on deck. Now that staffing complement has increased dramatically, in the upcoming year we look forward to once again ensuring that staff implore, explore opportunities for growth and learning that could lead them to qualifying as future lawyers or such other recognized positions in this community. It is further envisioned that training for all judicial posts, judges, the registrar, and the magistrates will recommence. The most affordable options for judicial training will be fully researched, given the lack of training available in Bermuda, to provide the most relevant and applicable training in order to further increase the quality and efficiency of the judiciary. The premises. Commercial Court and the Government Administration Building. Mr. Chair, the Commercial Court has now completed its ninth year. It like it was just yesterday. Nine. Ninth year of operation and continues to be well received by practitioners both here and overseas. The Dame Lois Brown Evans Building, which the magistrate's courts are housed in that building, opened in for business in April of 2011. The courts and administrative offices are now spread across the northern section of the second, third, and fourth floors. Since late 2016, the premises is now shared with Supreme Court, Family Matrimonial Division, IT, and Probate Division, which were displaced from the previous 113 Front Street location. The 113 Front Street location was partially reopened to house the Court of Appeal, and unfortunately that location in April or May of last year was deemed unfit. Mm -hmm. The administrative staff were also relocated to this location. This facility as a whole provides a safe and secure environment for the public, judicial officers, lawyers, and defendants. There continues to be seamless transitions of prisoners from corrections vehicles through the ground floor sally port to the elevators and straight to the holding cells located to the rear of the courtrooms. The majority of the judicial department's increase is due to funding of salaries due to the rise in pay scales approved by the joint grading panel over the last year. The estimates also um, are, are attributed to the need for adequate security to protect our courts 
and all using them. The request for proposal process began in late 2018 and it is intended to be completed by 31st of March 2019 when a new two-year contract will be drafted. In addition, our audio recording system or the Court Smart, which is the official record of the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal requires updating. Additional IT equipment must also be maintained to support the need of the justice system. With respect to the S Supreme Court, Mr. Chair, um, and please note that the statistics that have been provided are uh, those that were available at the time of preparation of the performance measures, and it reflects the actual uh, statistics for the period January to September 2018. So are we on line 13010? Minister? I was getting to that. I was just trying to. <laughs> I'm a little parched. So line item 13000, criminal injuries compensation. This cost center provides for payments to victims of criminal acts as decided by the board. $325,000 in awards were paid out, which was the extent of the budget allocation for that year. The increase of $55,000 represents funding for an administrative post to support the chairperson <coughs> of the Criminal Injuries Compensation and the Liquor Licensing Board. Line item 13010, Supreme Court. This cost center provides for the salaries and operational expenses for the administration of the Supreme Court Registry, for which there are 10 posts, including the assistant registrar and manager, accounts and administrative officers. The expense decrease is due to a movement in salaries for vacant posts being funded at the lowest pay grade, post pay grades. 335 new civil, new civil matters were filed. There were 102 divorces filed in 2018. Line item 13015, courtrooms and chambers. This cost center provides for the salaries and operational expenses for the courtrooms and chambers of the Supreme Court, criminal, civil, and commercial and family matrimonial. There are 19 posts, including the Chief Justice, puny judges, and the registrar's post. The expenses increase is due to a combination of a movement in salaries due to vacant posts being funded at the lower end of the post pay scale, salary increments and in funding for the assistant puny judge. There were 29 indictments filed and 42 indictments filed and 50, 59 civil and criminal appeals filed from the magistrate's court. Line item 13020. Court of Appeal. This cost center provides the sitting and retainer fees of the President of the Court of Appeal, four Justices of Appeal, and the salaries of two posts, namely an Administrative Officer and an Administrative Assistant. The expense increase is due to a combination of a movement in salaries due to vacant posts being funded at the lower end of the post pay scale and salary increments. The Court of Appeal meets three times a year. Sessions are three weeks long, and the number of appeal cases filed in 2018 was 35. Line item, Mr. Chair, 13025, Court and Technology Office. This cost center provides for the salaries for information technology section for which there are three posts, the IT manager, the IT assistant, and the data entry clerk. This funding includes transcription services, maintenance fees for the court case management system, or GEMS, court reporting system, court smart, and telephone system. Equipment and software applications must be maintained, kept up to date, and will ultimately have to be replaced when necessary. We must ensure that the court smart and other information technology systems work well. The ultimate goal of electronic filing throughout the courts will be a significant future expense where funding will need to be earmarked. Through thorough research will be conducted this year in relation to the cost of electronic filing software, which would be the most appropriate for our courts, courts as this expense can be upwards of $1.5 million. Uh, turning now to line item 13040, the Magistrate's Court. This cost center provides funding for the senior magistrate, four magistrates, and acting appointments where necessary. The magistrates adjudicate upon civil, criminal, traffic, and family matters. There are also the mental health, drug treatment, and the piloting driving under the influence courts, which continue to seek to reduce recidivism by addressing the drug, alcohol, and mental health challenges of offenders. 
In late 2016, Court 4, located in the Dame Lois Brown Evans Building, was redesigned as a Supreme Court due to the health and safety issues at 113 Front Street. This reduced the number of courts from six to five. All five courts continue to experience heavy caseloads, and as such, the court calendars remain full to the extent where court dates are being issued starting at three months in advance. Plea courts are often standing room only. The senior magistrate has increased his acting magistrate roster so as to give opportunities to those in the legal profession to acquire judicial and skills which would put them in a position to elevate to the bench. Line item 13050, civil records. The civil section is overseen by the office manager and is administered by one senior court associate who has general supervision over two court associates. This section provides case management and court services for the resolution of civil claims up to $25,000, landlord and tenant matters under the Landlord and Tenant Act 1974 and the Rent Increases Domestic Premises Control Act 1978. The filing fees for civil matters have not been amended in over 20 years. Legislative amendments are required to increase fees for the preparation of these files. The process has begun and has been submitted to the Attorney General's Chambers for a review. There were 1,924 new civil cases filed in 2018. It is to be noted that this is the lowest number of civil cases heard in the Magistrates Court over the last five years. As was noted in 2017, this may be as a result of the improvement of the economy, which allowed potential litigants to meet their financial obligations. There has been an intention to increase the civil jurisdiction of the Magistrates Court to $50,000, and if this occur occurs, then this will invariably increase the number of cases filed and the overall number of cases dealt with in the Magistrates Court. This will require additional staff to process the relevant court documents. The civil section of the Magistrates Court has endured a number of staffing changes over the past five years, but this section is now fully staffed, albeit some of these staff members are temporarily relieved staff. This section had a salary increase for each post based on the job description review, and thus the reason for the 10% increase. Line item cost center 16, sorry, 13060, family and child support. The family court was established by section 13 of the Children's Act 1998 to exercise the jurisdiction conferred upon the court by that act. There are two family courts, each comprised of a magistrate and two panel members pursuant to section 12 of the Magistrates Court Act 1948. The family court is a specialized court which was created to handle the specific needs of children whether born within or outside of marriage and matters arising in respect of their custody, care, maintenance and violations against the law for juvenile offenders. The Family Support Office serves the public and the Magistrates Court by providing customer service, records management, and financial control. This office also provides services to other government agencies such as the Department of Child and Family Services and Court Services. The total court case, law, case load for 2018 was 2014 cases, which represent a nominal decline of 4% over the 2017. The family court had an additional 151 new cases filed in 2018. The number of juvenile cases saw a 33% decline when compared to 2018 in 2017, and there was also a 20% decline in the number of domestic violence protection orders, or DVPOs, as of the 31st of December 2018. The total amount of child support payments received in 2019 is four million two hundred eighty-eight thousand eight hundred nine dollars, which is marginally lower than the 2017 figure of four million five hundred eighty-two thousand five hundred fifty-two dollars, and this represents a six point four percent decrease, or equivalent to two hundred ninety-three thousand seven hundred forty-three dollars. In 2018, the number of cases heard under the Children's Act 1998, which includes care orders, access, maintenance, and care and control, increased by 7% or 41 cases in comparison to 2018. By year end, 31st of December 2018, the total number of these cases declined by 4% or 49 cases. The $63,000 or 16% increase in this cost center comprises of the regrading of posts from the job description review, which was approved by the joint grading panel in late February 2018, 
as well as the inclusion of funding for a substantive administrative assistant post, which was enormously, erroneously excluded from last year's budget. Line item 13070, administration. Administration provides overall control of the personnel, facilities, and financial resources of Magistrates Court. There are six staff, which includes the court manager, office manager, administrative assistant, accounts officer, and two court associates who perform all cashier services for Magistrates Court. We continue to accommodate the needs of the public by opening the cashier's office during lunch hours. Over the past year, there were 1,824 customers served during the lunch period from 11.45 a.m. to 2.15 p.m. This is an indication that this service is being heavily utilized. Therefore, we will continue to remain open during these periods. The total amount collected by Magistrates Court for all categories, including child support, equals the sum of 8,814,823 in 2018. The 3 percent increase in this cost center comprises of the pay scale uplift from the job description review. I'd like to pause for a moment and acknowledge the presence of the learned and honorable Attorney General Kathy Lynn Simmons, who has joined the chamber along with her permanent secretary, Marva O'Brien, and the controller of the ministry. Pardon me? Line item 1308, criminal traffic records. For five consecutive years between 2014 and 2018, the total number of outstanding warrants has steadily increased. In 2018, there were 11,684 outstanding warrants within Magistrates Court, which is an increase of over from the 2017 figure. The total amount of unpaid fines that have accrued as a result of the warrants not being executed has escalated to 2 million $395,312.32 as of the 31st of December 2018. Interagency collaboration has been beneficial for the execution of warrants. Magistrates have made payment orders so that offenders could pay their fines over a reasonable period of time, thereby removing the possibility of incarcerating them for default. The Criminal Records Office of the Magistrates Court provides case management functions for criminal, traffic, and parking records. For the past year, the Criminal Traffic Records section processed a total of 1,934 record requests as of the 31st of December 2018. This represents an additional 606 requests, or a 45 percent increase when compared to 2017. In July 2018, the Police Criminal Records Office in Prospect closed their operations indefinitely. Subsequently, the public were referred to the Magistrates Court for securing vetting, and this resulted in an increase in the number of applications received. The $69,000 uplift in this cost center encompasses the approved pay scale increases from the job description review and funding of an unfunded post that will be abolished to create a new administrative assistant post to provide dedicated administrative and clerical support for two independent boards. Turning now to line, line item 19 0, sorry, 13090, the bailiff's office. This office provides for the service and execution of court papers inclusive of civil, family, Supreme Court, and foreign service. There is one head bailiff, deputy provost marshal general, one administrative assistant, and five bailiffs who travel throughout the island serving court processes. During the past year, the bailiffs were assigned 2,207 documents for service. There were also 37 writs of execution orders executed in 2018, which is more than double the amount of orders executed in the previous year. As of the 31st of December 2018, the bailiff team were successful in executing 87% of their assigned documents, which was a significant increase over the previous year. The success was primarily due to the decrease in documents issued by the courts. The 2019-20 estimated budget for this cost center has declined largely in part to an overstatement of $53,610 being the erroneous inclusion of an administrative assistant temporarily relief salary in the 2018-19 budget. With respect to revenue, Mr. Chair. The revenue that uh, is reported in this section is up to the calendar year 2018, December 2018, 31st. Traffic and parking fines. The major components of revenue are traffic and criminal fines. 
The total amount recorded for traffic fines was $2,247,845, $445,000 in for parking fines, and $258,584 for criminal fines. These amounts tend to fluctuate in line with the volume of offenses prosecuted, the number of successful convictions, and the levels of fines imposed. There are significant collection difficulties associated with recovering court fines, such as locating offenders, often repeat offenders, which leads to outstanding warrants. It is to be noted that in June 2017, the Traffic Offenses Procedures Amendment and Validation Act 2015 was implemented in law. The amendment to this act increased the parking fines from $50 to $75 and altered the receipts of revenues from the Accountant General to the Corporation of Hamilton. Soon after the act was passed, the Corporation of Hamilton assumed the responsibility of managing the traffic wardens from the Bermuda Police Service. Currently, the traffic wardens enforce parking regulations within the city of Hamilton and the town of St. George's. From the 1st of July 2017 to the 31st of December 2018, over $617,000 has been collected by the magistrate's court's cashiers from parking ticket fines. However, the financial controller for the Ministry of Legal Affairs has disclosed that the Bermuda government paid out a total of $420,200 in parking ticket fines in 2018 to the Corporation of Hamilton. There are concerns that the Magistrate's Court cashier section provides all of the resources to collect parking ticket fines on behalf of the Corporation of Hamilton, and these resources are funded by the Government of Bermuda. There is no financial reimbursement by the Corporation of Hamilton to cover the cost of collecting their fines, as 100 percent of the fines collected are transferred directly to the Corporation of Hamilton. It results in a loss of revenue to the Bermuda Government. Court fees for the Supreme Court. Mr. Chair, regrettably, the fees collected for Supreme Court matters has not been a revenue that has historically been recorded. The majority of Supreme Court fees are paid by way of revenue stamps that counsel and parties purchase through the Accountant General. This uncaptured revenue needs to be recorded to show the true revenue of the judiciary. The Registrar has submitted amendments to the relevant legislation to the Minister of Legal Affairs with recommendations for increase to the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal fees. These fees have not been increased since the implementation of the relevant legislation, which is a period of over 20 years. This clearly does not fall in line with the true value of the services provided by the Department and are seriously outdated. Court fees for the Magistrate's Court. The revenue received to date for civil fees for 2018 is $158,990. As stated above, the process has commenced to amend the civil court fees. It is anticipated that appropriate increases will be instituted through the necessary legislation. Liquor license. $552,188 in revenue was collected during 2018. While the number of liquor licensing granted declined when compared to 2017, the amount of revenue collected was in line with the 2017 due to the introduction of the issuance of nightclub licenses. Still, the increase surpassed our expectations as 2017's increases was as a result of the America's Cups activities. Proposals have been presented by the Department to the Ministry in relation to the increase in liquor licenses and fees, which has the potential of producing an additional $400,000 in revenue per annum based on the sums received in 2018. Stamp duty on deceased estates. The value of the deceased gross estate is reduced by various statutory deductions and exemptions, such as the value of the primary family homestead and the spousal benefit, to determine the taxable value or the net estate. A severe shortage of staff available to review probate applications resulted in a sizable reduction in the number of probates processed and grants issued in the last year. For the period April 2018 to January 2019, representing the 10 months, 105 grants were issued, resulting in a total of tax assessment of $1,094,233. And for the period April 2017 to March 2018, 152 grants were issued, resulting in the total tax assessment of $6,779,659. It is to be noted that this figure includes an assessment on a single estate in the amount of $4,521,441. It is to be further noted that assessments of this size on a single estate is not the norm. For the period April 2018 to January 2019, revenue collected was $5,357,790. For the period April 2018 to January 2019, revenue collected was $5,357,790.
for the period April 2017 to March 2018, revenue collected was $6,779,893. Total revenue for 2019-20, Mr. Chair, is as follows and can be located at page B87 of the budget book. In, consider in consideration of the current economic climate, total revenues are budgeted to increase by approximately 16% for the upcoming fiscal year. Capital expenditure. Capital expenditure estimates for 2019-20 are found at page C9 of the approved estimates in revenue and expenditure budget book. The Judicial Department has been allocate, allocated a total of $281,000 for fiscal year 1920. $267,000 is allocated for court reporting with the remainder Remaining $14,000 is intended to be used to purchase computer equipment that has fully depreciated in value. Minister, I'd like to recognize the presence of former Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Walter Lister. Mr. Chair, turning now to Head 4 the Attorney General's Chambers. Mr. Chair, the, and that can be found at page B93 of the budget book. The mission statement, department objective, and current accounts estimates of the AG's chambers are included in head four, and again at page B93. The mission statement is as follows. As legal advisors to government, the Attorney General's Chambers is committed to providing high-quality legal advice and litigation services and to drafting sound legislation ever mindful of the need to protect the public interest and to safeguard and preserve the fundamental rights and freedoms enshrined in our Constitution. In doing so, we also pledge to uphold the traditions and equity, fairness, and justice inherent in the legal profession while simultaneously remaining on the cutting edge of legal trends and technologies to ensure that we are abreast of and in accord with global trends. The uh, expenditure for the Attorney General's Chambers is $5,308,000, and that's been allocated to Chambers, and it represents a decrease in the sum of $1,000. Mr. Chair, the Attorney General's Chambers' objectives are as follows. One, to provide quality legal services to the government of Bermuda. Two, to advise all government ministries, departments, and entities on the law applicable to their operational requirements. Three, to draft legislation as required to implement the government's legislative agenda, to maintain Bermuda's legislative database, and to support law reform. Four, to draft contracts, international instruments for mutual tax information exchange, conveyances, and other documents required for public purpose, to, and to provide advice on private bills. And five, to conduct litigation in the civil courts of Bermuda on behalf of the government of Bermuda. Mr. Chair, line item 14010, administration. The Attorney General's Chambers is functionally divided into six programs. The first being administration, which provides administrative support to the Attorney General, Solicitor General, and Crown Counsel. This cost center provides salaries for an office manager, a receptionist, a records management clerk, and an administrative assistant in the accounts. It also supports the purchasing of office supplies that are common to all sectors of the department. The modest year-over-year -year increase is due to anticipated changes in the salary grading funds allocated for an administrative post and an increase in funding for the repair and maintenance of office equipment. Line item 14020, advisory. Mr. Chair, the advisory section is responsible for providing quality legal advice to all government departments and to conduct litigation matters brought by or against the government. Additionally, advisory is responsible for recovering debts owed to the government. The cost center provides salaries for one solicitor general, one deputy solicitor general, two senior crown counsel, six crown counsel, three administrative assistants, and one pupil. The increase is due to the additional cost for consultant services. Line item 14030, legislative drafting. Mr. Chair, the legislative drafting section advises regarding proposals to introduce or amend legislation. 
It drafts primary and subordinate legislation for all government departments and provides advice and support to ministries in the House of Assembly and Senate as their respective legislation progresses. This section also provides advice to ministers and the governor on legal and constitutional issues and on matters of parliamentary procedure. The salaries provided for in this cost center include those of the Chief Parliamentary Counsel, Deputy, Deputy Chief Parliamentary Counsel, five Parliamentary Counsel, two Assistant Parliamentary Counsel, a Legislative Database Manager, a Legislative Editor, a Legislative Administrator, and a Legislative Database Administrator. The year-over-year -year budgetary decrease is due to the reallocation of funding from salaries to consultant services, which resulted in an annual savings of $46,000. Mr. Chair, line item 14040, Revised Laws of Bermuda. This cost center supports the consolidation, periodic revision, and publication of the Laws of Bermuda. It is responsible for providing members of both houses of the legislature, businesses, lawyers, and the general public with access to the revised statutes and regulations of Bermuda. It also supports the ongoing consolidation of primary and subordinate legislation. The year-over-year -year decrease is due to anticipated savings from other cost centers within the ministry to support software maintenance for the pro-law system. Mr. Chair, line item 14050, debt collection. The debt enforcement unit within the Attorney General's Chambers was established by the government to assist the Department of Social Insurance and the Office of Tax Commissioner in the recovery of unpaid social insurance contributions, payroll tax, land tax, and other taxes owed to the government. The cost center provides salaries for one Crown Counsel and one Junior Crown Counsel, as well as an administrator. Line item 14060, Law Library. Mr. Chair, this program provides for the cost of maintaining the law library in the Attorney General's Chambers, which includes the purchase of books, periodicals, and the provision of access to leading online legal information sources such as LexisNexis and Westlaw. The modest increase reflects the increased cost of subscriptions. Capital acquisitions, Mr. Chair. The budget allocation for the capital, acquisition, capital expenditures um, can be located at page C9 of the budget book. The Attorney General's Chambers has been allocated a total of $5,000 for fiscal 2019-20. More funding has been given to Chambers for capital acquisitions. This funding is intended to purchase furniture and computers to replace fully depreciated assets with no residual value. Output measures, Mr. Chair. During the 2018 calendar year, 69 acts were enacted and 155 statutory instruments made. In addition to the annual budget legislation and amendments relating to anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism financing in preparation for the CFAT of on-site assessment in September, there were a number of new and amending acts to give effect to the government's legislative agenda on topics including initial coin offering, digital asset business, economic substance, family mediation, psychological practitioners, allied health professionals, and evidence audiovisual link. The Bermuda Laws website, which contains all of Bermuda's current laws and subordinate legislation, is updated in real time from within chambers, and we are continuing to make improvements to the site. Since November 2018, as part of the E-Gazette project, statutory instruments are now gazetted by publication on the website, which clearly indicates the operational date. Over the past budget year, the Attorney General's Chambers received 15 mutual legal assistant requests with an increase of four in the number of requests that was received the previous year. Notwithstanding this increase, the number of days for the Attorney General to respond has remained constant. With respect to staffing, Mr. Chair, there are currently three vacant posts within the Civil Advisory and Litigation Section of the Attorney General's Chambers, one Deputy Solicitor General, one Crown Counsel, and one Administrative Assistant. The vacant post for the Deputy Solicitor General will remain unfunded for the budget year 2019-20. The current staffing levels of the Civil Advisory Section are as follows. One Solicitor General, one Deputy Solicitor General, two Senior Crown Counsel, six Crown Counsel, two Administrative Assistants, and one Paralegal to the Solicitor General. There have been no staffing changes in the Debt Enforcement Unit. In the Drafting Section of Chambers, there are currently no vacancies. There are currently seven parliamentary council, which includes the chief and deputy chief, one consultant parliamentary council, and two assistant parliamentary councils. 
In addition to these dedicated lawyers who are responsible for drafting all government bills and statutory instruments, the section is fortunate to have an excellent administrative team comprising four persons, each of whom play a vital part in the timely production, publication, and consolidation of legislation. Training and development. The Attorney General's Chambers include within its mandate the development of its professional and administrative staff. Members of the Civil Advisory and Administrative Section of Chambers attend training and personal development courses offered by the Department of Human Resources. Members of the Advisory Section also provided in-house presentations on advisory and litigation matters. The Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Legal Affairs and the Solicitor General attended a plenary session of the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force in Barbados in November of last year. The CFATF is an organization of states and territories in the Caribbean that have agreed to implement common countermeasures against money laundering and is a regional organization that is associated with the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF. They attended various sessions, including the observation of, anal of, of activities surrounding the mutual evaluation process of Cayman Islands, current risk assessments, and the level of effectiveness of the Cayman Islands, and personal development courses offered by the Department of Human Resources, one of the assistant parliamentary counsel continues work towards obtaining a drafting diploma offered online from the University of Athabasca in Canada. The other assistant parliamentary counsel will start the course soon. Members of the drafting team take turns in giving in-house monthly presentations and lead roundtable discussions on drafting matters. Turning now, Mr. Chair, to the initiatives for the upcoming year. Uh, a principal focus with respect to the advisory section will continue to be on the development of Bermudians and Chambers, particularly in using senior counsel to assist junior counsel and pupils with advice and guidance on advisory and litigation matters. The advisory section intends to fill the vacant post of Crown Counsel and the post of Administrative Assistant in the forthcoming fiscal year. Improving the personal development of staff will remain paramount by providing them the opportunity to attend training, courses offered by the Department of Human Resources. The advisory section, in addition, will continue to review contracts for the various ministries and departments to, aim the same in making, to aid the same in making better decisions in contract negotiations. This advisory section will also continue to review the assignment of specific counsel to provide advisory and litigation representation to ministries and departments. They will seek to improve case management system to reduce the demand for paper resources as well as provide more in-house presentation by counsel on a variety of legal topics. Turning now to the legislative drafting section, staff and training. The principal focus will continue to be on the development of Bermudians in legislative drafting. Experienced drafters, including the consultant parliamentary counsel, will continue to mentor the assistant parliamentary counsel so that they will be able to draft independently. Legislative information management system, or the LIM system, is uh, legislation is quickly produced and accurately using LIMS, which is a customized two upper meters drafting style. This combined with the important role of the legislative editor has kept the number of errors and inconsistencies found in legislation during House and Senate debates to a minimum, thereby expediting the legislative process. The maintenance of LIMS is through a Canadian vendor who provides timely professional assistance whenever necessary and regularly updates our software within the latest versions and technical support. It is intended to continue to improve the database and to post new laws within a week of enactment on the Bermuda Laws online website, which is www.bermudalaws.bm, which is hosted locally by FireMind. Consolidation, which is the incorporation of amendments into existing laws, is more time-consuming since the amendments are checked by the drafters as well as the legislative database manager. The goal is to continue to complete the process within one month of the enactment of the amending legislation, which has been achieved in the first few years. Subject to resolving all outstanding technical and security issues with the assistance of the Information and Digital Technology Office, it is anticipated that legislation will be introduced in 2019 to declare that electronic online version to be the official law of Bermuda. That concludes that particular head um, Zero 04, uh, Mr. Chair. Turning now to Head 23, the Department of Child and Family Services.
Mr. Chair, that can be located at page B96 of the budget book, and there is an errata that has been handed out this morning as well, so I could, okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to now present the 2019-20 estimates of care services, care and protection services for children, residential and home-based services for families, assessment, intervention, and counseling services for children, adolescents, and families. Mr. Chairman, the current account estimate for Head 23, the Department of Child and Family Services, begins at page B96 and has a cost center of $15,915,000, which was allocated to them, which represents an increase of $200,000, or 1%, from the original budget of 2018-19. The Department of Child and Family Services continues to focus on developing an integrated service that allows children adolescents, and families to receive services that are appropriate and coordinated, thus meeting the needs of families and assisting them with the diverse challenges they face. These challenges include, but are not limited, to lack of parenting, social and life skills, the ability to maintain housing, secure employment, effective budgeting, the abuse of substances, involvement in antisocial behavior, cognitive defici deficit deficits, educational challenges, mental health issues, and anger management, which all contribute to these diverse challenges that are now seemingly exasperated by the challenging economic times families are facing. The Department of Child and Family Services is charged with the responsibility of promoting and protecting the best interests and social well-being of children, adolescents, adults, and families. Mr. Chairman, in, no, in order to meet these responsibilities, the Department operates four programs. Program 2301, Services to Children and Young Persons. Program 2302, Services to Individual and Families. Program 2303, Residential Treatment Services. And Program 2304, Administration. Mr. Chair, in the fiscal year 2018-19, the Department of Child and Family Services continued with its efforts of providing a seamless continuum of services to children and families by examining and redeploying resources to meet changing program and client needs. These changes continue to be implemented based on a performance quality improvement focus that is consistent with best practice standards. These standards are defined by accreditation requirements in the area of human service provision. Service improvements have been achieved by the Department implementing a strategy that begins with the enhancement of a structured decision-making tool designed specifically for Bermuda giving account to our social and cultural norms. This tool utilizes a comprehensive assessment that ensures clients receive the appropriate service from the appropriate agency. This process reduces referral duplication, closely previously identifies gaps in service delivery, and increases overall effectiveness and efficiency of programs. Utilization of this tool has resulted in an improved comprehensive service delivery system that has increased response time to initial referrals. It enhances appropriate prioritizing of referrals according to risk, and it ensures that the highest risks are addressed first resulting in better responses and positive outcomes for clients. Mr. Chair, the Department of Child and Family Services business units are discussed by programs as follows. With, re with regard to program 2301, and again, I'm still on page B96, services to children and young persons. The Happy Valley Child Care is covered under this program. The estimate for this fiscal year is $1,038,000, and the output measures for the Happy Valley uh, child Care Day Program are found at page B99 of the estimates book. For business unit 33010, there's a budget allocation of $1,038,000 in this fiscal year, and this represents an increase of $120,000, or 13%, from the fiscal year 2018-19. This increase is a direct result of stack, staff increments. We continue to contain expenditure within the budget allocated for 2019-20. The feeding program, the clothing program, and the enrichment program will have been curtailed so as to minimize the impact of the wraparound services provided to high-risk children referred to for care and a head start at the Happy Valley Daycare, Child, Day, Child Care excuse me, Center. The Happy Valley Child Care Center is the only government-operated child care center which provides high-quality child care for children from three months to four years of age and accommodates a maximum of 40 children. 
Most of the children are from Pembroke, Devonshire, and Warwick areas, but the center also has an intake of children from other parts of the island. Government has mandated that priority be given to children referred by helping agencies such as the Department of Child and Family Services, Teen Services, Financial Assistance, Department of Health, and the Child Development Program. These agencies, along with families experiencing various challenges, account for 60 percent of the child care center's intake. Happy Valley Child Care Center's monthly fee is $400 for all children enrolled. If a child is in the care of the Department of Child and Family Services, they do not qualify for the child daycare allowance, and as such, their costs are absorbed by the department. During the fiscal year 2017-18, the amount of fees collected was $192,000. It is most important to note that the cost per child is higher than the fees currently paid by parents. This is because the Happy Valley Child Care Center, a first-class facility, is specifically designed to meet the comprehensive needs of young children. It provides an extensive curriculum of high academic standards with trained teachers who are continuously involved in professional growth and development. It offers enrichment programs that encourage parental involvement and growth development to strengthen family functioning and improve child development. Comprehensive services offered at the Happy Valley, child, Happy Valley Care Center include an intervention program, a full nutritional program that provides morning snack, lunch, and afternoon snack that is monitored and approved by the Health Department's public health nutritionist, mandatory parenting classing, classes and involvement, movement, computer activities, reading and writing, science, maths, community service, field trips, writing, gardening, tennis, and swimming lessons, along with other curriculum activities offered at the Happy Valley Child Care Center to assist in the overall development of the children at the center. In July of 2018, 16 children graduated from the program and were well prepared for attending preschool, with two of the graduates reading at the emergent level. Happy Valley Child Care Center consistently utilizes child assessment outcomes for classroom planning and individual in intervention lesson activities. The high scope of curriculum and assessment tool reflected outstanding results that validate Happy Valley Child Care Center's commitment to an inclusive learning model. The results for infants and toddlers and preschoolers mapped steadily improvement in all areas of developmental growth. Happy Valley Child Care Center received reaccreditation with no conditions from the Bermuda National Standards Committee for 2018, and it will be up for the third reaccreditation in 2020. There is still an increased demand for child care placement at the Happy Valley Child Care Center. 150 applications were received from the 2018-2019, with the facility only being able to enroll 20 new students. During the last school year, four students withdrew, two relocated to the UK, one benefited from the pilot preschool program at Warwick Preschool, and one transferred to a private nursery. The inability to, accom in to accommodate increasing demands coupled with the need of care for special needs children remain ongoing challenges facing the Happy Valley Child Care Center. Mr. Chairman, fathers and mothers are actively involved in parenting classes, school program activities, parent-teacher conferences, and social interaction opportunities with their children. Grandparents and extended family members have been positively involved in the center's program as well. Happy Valley Child Care Center continues to uphold its commitment to partnering with community resources. In collaboration with the Child Development Program, two-year-old assessments are conducted at the center. Intervention services and parenting classes are also provided by CDP on site. Happy Valley Child Care Center contains, continues to serve as an internship site for the Bermuda College students enrolled in the Child Care Certificate Program, as well as a community service site for public and private schools. A broad range of community activities involvement designed for children's enrichment learning include giving out food to the elderly, visiting senior care centers, visiting Dolphin Quest, historical sites across the island, and hosting its annual Week of the Young Child Mini Fair that invites neighboring nurseries and preschools in celebration of young children. This event is greatly supported by the uh, center's alumni, parents, family, and the community. Community resources that support children's learning on site are presentations from SunSmart, 
dental care from the government health department, fire and police services as well. Support services for speech occupational therapy and physical therapy are also provided by the government department of health and the child development program. Mr. Chair, Happy Valley Child Care Center being housed in an older building that is in need of constant maintenance and repair. And we would like to thank the Works and Engineering for their commitment and supportive services in addressing the maintenance needs of Happy Valley Child Care Center throughout the year. Happy Valley Child Care Center endeavors to maintain a first class facility while educating children in a safe, healthy, and caring environment. Mr. Chair, on behalf of the Ministry of Legal Affairs, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the staff at the Happy Valley Child Care Center, their Active Parent Teacher Association, their volunteers, and community partners for their continued dedication to Bermuda's most vulnerable children resources, which are our children and our children are our future. Turning now, um, Mr. Chair, to cost item 2302, services to individual and family, still maintaining on um, page B96. The activities covered in programming 2302 are intake, assessment, investigation, family preser preservation, formerly known as family services, foster care and counseling and life skills, formerly known as the Bermuda Youth Counseling Services. The estimate for these activities for the fiscal year 2019-20 is $5,961,000, and this represents a $64,000 or 1% increase compared to 2018-19 budget allocation. Mr. Chair, the Intake Assessment and Investigation Unit provides first response and protective services to the children of Bermuda. This is achieved with the use of our structured decision-making tool that was referenced earlier. This tool, when used in this area, provides guidance to the worker indicating the appropriate response time to initiate having sight of a child, begin the investigation, and any related services required. The output measures for this unit can also be located in the budget book at page B99. Mr. Chair, the intake and assessment team provides care and protective services to the children of Bermuda. This is achieved through three specialized units, namely screening, investigations, and assessments team, with a total of 15 staff. The output measures for intake and assessments can also be located at page B99 in the budget book. Mr. Chair, the investigation team received 1,139 new referrals on children. This was a slight decrease from 2017 when 1,200 and 22 new referrals were screened by the Department of Child and Family Services. The shift to one central screening system continues to have a significant impact on the number of new cases that are processed for investigative or assessment services within the department. All screenings are reviewed to ensure that workers make contact in the designated time frames while providing immediate feedback to the referrer. This service is reviewed quarterly to ensure that best practice standards are, were maintained. This team also achieved re-accreditation in October of 2018. The investigation team completed 100% of the screening assessments in the stipulated time frames. Of the total number of cases screened, 917 were assessed as needing investigation or assessment services. 222 did not meet the threshold for child protection and were therefore screened out and referred to other services within the community. Mr. Chair, referrals with, that have been received for the following types of abuse are as follows. Neglect, 465. Sexual abuse, 244. Physical abuse, 200. Behavior problems, 100. Emotional abuse, 84. Or other services, 46. Mr. Chair, the investigation team continues to see an increase in the number of children referred for child-on-child -child sexual abuse or sexualized behavior. This accounts for 51% of the total number of sexual abuse referrals. Children exposed to domestic violence have consistently accounted for the highest number of neglect referrals for the past five years. In 2018, the department received 209 referrals for children who are exposed to family violence. This accounts for 45% of the ne neglect referrals for 2018. The vast majority of the referrals are received from the police, which represents 291, and the schools, which represents 336. Of the 917 that were screened in 
for investigation and services, 528 have been closed or transferred within the department for additional supportive services. To assist with a better understanding of the investigative process, the process includes the following activities. The referral is prioritized based on the nature of the report and can require a 24-hour, 5-day, or 10-day response. The screening process will determine if police involvement is needed. Records are checked to determine if the case is already known to the department. An investigation plan is developed. The child is interviewed. The parent or guardian, immediate family members, and other collateral resources are interviewed when applicable. Witnesses would be interviewed by the police. Obtain medical and other assessment reports. Assess the child's immediate safety for all in-home abuse cases. A secondary interview may be required based on the information that is gathered. Determine if the report is verified, substantiated, suspected, inconclusive, or unsubstantiated. The department conducts face-to-face contacts based on the level of risk. And an outcome letter is provided to the mandated reporter and the parent or guardian. The investigation process has two main purposes. One is to gather as much relevant factual information as possible, and two, assess to determine if there are immediate service needs of the child and the family. This includes, this may include the department providing ongoing interventions from other teams or community partners. Mr. Chair, the intake section continues to work cooperatively with the families they are investigating and assessing. When investigations are required on new and open cases to the department, a safety assessment and plan must be completed on, on all in the home. The goal of the safety assessment is to ensure that the children are safe and that the parent or guardian has agreed on the plan. A primary objective is for the department and the family to work together without seeking a court order. As a result, the investigation social workers completed 589 safety assessments. This form of engagement with, with parents allows the department to ensure that the children are safe while promoting and preserving the integrity of the family. Risk assessments are completed before a case is transferred or closed, and the team completed 552. The number of safety assessments completed increased significantly from 432 in 2017. Mr. Chair, the assessment team is required to complete comprehensive assessments on children who are experiencing issues ranging from substance abuse to cognitive challenges. The team administered 257 assessments and completed 55 reports that provided parents, social workers, and other professionals with clear recommendations for intervention and support services for each child and the family. The assessment team provides in-service presentations within the department and the community. Mr. Chair, the foster care section of the Department of Child and Family Services is responsible for providing alternative living arrangements for children under the age of 18 years old who are in need of out-of-home placement. The team for, uh, was responsible for a total of 88 children, their birth parents and foster parents during the last budget year. This represents a numerical increase of eight foster children, birth families, and foster families from the year prior. During the last budget year, the foster care program was serviced a total of 11 therapeutic foster children. The children in this category have a variety of physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral challenges. Therapeutic foster parents are compensated at a higher rate than traditional foster parents. They sign contracts that outline the levels of care expected based on the children's needs. At the end of 2018, a total of one child reunited with their birth parents. Six youth reached the age of 18 and aged out of the foster, former foster care system, but continued to reside with their foster families. Three foster youth were transferred to a psychoeducational program during the year. The foster care coordinator recruited four new foster parents this year. As the community changes, it has become increasingly difficult to recruit foster parents. Despite the challenges, the foster parents who are being recruited are of high caliber and willing to work in partnership with foster care, and we still remain hard-pressed to have open and suitable available placements for emergencies and hard-to-care-for children. In May of 2018, Foster Parent Awareness Month, the foster care team arranged a tea to honor all foster parents. Each foster parent was presented with a mug, a certificate, and personalized picture frame by the Minister of Social Development and Sports. The keynote speaker was the former foster child, Janita Parentchief. Ms. Parentchief discussed the importance of foster parents, and her former foster parents were present for the presentation. The department received numerous positive comments about this event from foster parents. 
Mr. Chairman, the department would like to acknowledge the foster parents of Bermuda, our unsung heroes, who provide loving, stable homes to children who have experienced significant trauma as a result of abuse and or neglect. Every day they make a foster child's life better by their numerous acts of care and kindness. Also, the department would like to acknowledge the Foster Parent Association, who work in partnership with the foster care team to support foster parents and provide the funds to enable foster children to participate in educational trips, attend specialized recreational programs, and to uh, resource laptops for school. Mr. Chair, Counseling and Life Skills Services mission is to advance and promote the emotional well-being of children up to 18 years of age and their family. Uh, the Counseling Life Skills Services, or CLSS, offers services that strengthen the knowledge, skills, positive experiences, and support systems of individuals and families to make healthy life choices. Individual and family issues include, but are not limited to family and relationship dynamics, co-parenting, grief and loss, communication, trauma, and adolescent substance use. In order to best serve the needs of clients, CLSS counselors work collaboratively with them to complete specific assessments of screening tools to measure progress and treatment planning that is geared towards positive growth and development. CLSS continues to align services and practices with the Department of Child and Family Services strategic plan. The aim of the restructuring of services to offer a more client-focused and efficient mode of service delivery. The Department of Child and Family Services requires that all referrals be made through the department's intake section. The referrals are screened and assessed to determine the needs of the individual child and their family. Mr. Chair, to meet the Council of Accreditation Standards, quarterly performance quality, quality improvement meetings occurred during this year to review program data, client trends, perform, perform file audits, client staff and stakeholders feedback, and staff development. We continue to align services and practices so they are consistent with the Department of Child and Family Services strategic plan. CLSS facilitated substance education groups at Cedarbridge Academy and Whitney Institute. In addition to the group, CLSS team members provided presentations to several community organizations. The Department of Child and Family Services establishment of centralized intake and assessment allows for a more coordinated assessment of client needs and integrated service delivery. The total number of clients for 2018 was 187. 105 youth and 82 parents received counseling services. Mr. Chair, new referrals for the year totaled 77. The highest number of male referrals was in the 15 to 18 age group, totaling 17. In the female category, the 10 to 14-year-olds and the 15 to 18 categories was the highest with 11. It is important to note that clients' families present with multi-problems issues such as high-risk behavior, adolescent substance misuse, parent-child rational issues, parent relationship issues, trauma, and emotional behavioral issues. Family and emotional behavior issues are the leading trend. We continue to receive domestic violence referrals. 30 parents and 20 children were referred during 2018. Services for domestic violence in a specialized service for the batterer and the victim, hence clients are referred to the community agencies for services. CLSS provided counseling to some children who witnessed domestic violence but it has highlighted a continued training need for this section and other sections working with children who witness domestic violence. CLSS also provides assistance with co-parenting services and support to children of divorce. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm getting ready to move into another line item. Would you like me to continue or would you like for me to move that we break for lunch? Thank you, Minister. I would prefer that we move that we break for lunch and resume after lunch at 2 o'clock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we now uh, rise for lunch and return at 2 o'clock p.m.